This is Tanya Pearson interviewing Viola Smith on January 15th, 2018 in Costa Mesa, California. Coast, that's right. For the Women of Rock Oral History Project. Thank you so much for participating. It's an honor to meet you. We're all very excited. Um, so this is a full personal and professional biography or life story. So I have a bunch of questions in the beginning, but I just want to start with where did you grow up? In Mount Calvary, Wisconsin. Okay. And I know you were the sixth of eight girls. That's and, right. And you had brothers? Two brothers. Uh, what was your relationship like with your siblings before you started playing? Relationship? We had a family orchestra of, of eight girls, and we were all very close. We, we never had arguments, really, very rarely. In fact, the only argument I can remember, I remember is that we had whipped cream. One was whipping cream, and the other one wanted to bowl. And they both wanted to bowl, and they wound up both having whipped cream all over their heads. <laughs> it's about the only argument I heard at home. They were very, we were a very docile family. Yeah. Um, and I know your father ran a dance hall. Um, what did both of your parents do for work, and what was your relationship like with your mother and your father? Wonderful relationship with the most, both mother and dad. And dad uh, had a tavern before he married. And uh, mother uh, was one of also big family. But every, everything is always very peaceful. We're arguing to their families and our families. I don't know. We were just a docile family. How did your dad decide to start the, the family band? Well, it's just a success, succession of girls in the family, and he wanted us all to be start with piano. We all had to study piano, eight of us. And so when my dad overheard, my, my, my brother overheard my dad say he's going to have a girl orchestra, my brother stopped practicing piano because he also had, he and his brother had also been practicing piano in their youth. So they stopped practicing immediately. They thought they'd get into, into the orchestra because Dad always talked about the girl orchestra he was going to have. And he had these eight girls all play piano, and then he'd put them on different instruments. And I was so lucky, so lucky to be the sixth one. As a sixth one, I was the, the drummer. And by that time, we needed a drum. And that is the luckiest thing in my life because I had two sisters older, one a trumpet player died early in life, a, a trombone player died early in life. So, and the rest of us lived to into almost through to the nineties into the hundreds. I'm 105. We were all a family of long-lived children, children. So I was a lucky one to be sixth and be the drummer. Yeah. And how did your brothers feel about not being included in the when my dad, When my, my brother heard that Dad said he was going to have a girl orchestra, that was the end of the practicing for the two boys. They would never touch the piano again. They wanted to be in the orchestra, too. And you said, I was, I was watching some other interviews that you've done uh, during the past five years or so, and you said that your childhood pretty much consisted of practice, practice, practice. Oh, yes. So long as we practiced, we barely had to do any work around the house. We always had maids, and uh, we just, just so we practiced. We had to practice two hours a day on the piano, each one of us. So we had to have three pianos, two, three pianos at an organ to take care of all this practicing. And how did that... Um affect your studies, or did you still go to school? Well, this is all in my very youth, youth, you know. We, we, we went, we practiced, we uh, did orchestra work in the summer months for all those years. In the summer months, we, we do, uh, do engagements, and in the winter months, we were back in school, but also practicing all the time, and playing weekends, oh yes, weekends during our youth, too. And when you first, when you were assigned the drum, luckily, um, did you take lessons? On drums? A child? Well, fortunately, nearby was a cousin, a, a very commercial drummer cousin. So he helped me in my youth to get me started. And then later on, I studied with the different pit band drummers in Chicago and the various cities. The pit band drummers, I took lessons from all of them, all, all, all through my 
well, not through my life, but in the early years. We played a lot of theaters. When we started working commercially, we played through Chicago units, Jack Fine shows, and uh, and various Chicago units we'd play with. Um, and so you you were touring and playing professionally by the time you were about 12? Oh, no, 12 is, no, that's when I started to play drums, started to practice. No, I didn't play professionally until, well, actually, I guess 13 or 14, I was already playing. Yeah, I would say at age 14, I was playing professionally, okay. but just weekends, not, not school years. Mm -hmm. And I was still studying. I mean, I was, those were study years. Yeah. So we didn't play, we didn't work much. Was your dad, was he your manager? He was our manager. Mm -hmm. um, it would never have happened without dad, making us all practice piano and all that, you know, right from youth. Did you love it from the very beginning? Oh, we all loved fun? it. Oh, we, we loved not have to have to do housework. We were all happy to practice. We were great at practicing piano. We just loved it, all of us. Yeah. So... You played in, in the family band um, from, you know, started when you were 12, played professionally, 13, 14, 15. Did you go to high school or how did, can you talk about when the family band sort of disbanded as your sisters got married and kind of where you went from there? Well, actually, we, uh, we, uh, what we did worked only weekends all through the years, earlier years just work weekends. So it didn't interfere with, me, with, with schooling. But I, went, I spent three, I had three years in college. Uh, I studied in, uh, in Columbia and at, in New York. After this effort got to New York, this is, it was in recent years, you know, in the later 40s, around 40, yeah, in the late 40s, I was in, Juilliard and, and Hunter College. I spent three years in school, uh, but also working weekends. A lot of time, a lot of orchestras I worked with, we worked weekends. So it worked out very well in my in my life. How did you get different jobs with different orchestras? Well, I wasn't time? with different orchestras. I was always with a family orchestra. Oh. We just went on and on, and the older ones dropped out, and then the younger ones, finally the two of us in the orchestra were sisters. My sister and I were the only ones who left, had the Coquettes Orchestra, and we had the Coquettes Orchestra for four, four years. We had other orchestra musicians in with us, and there was just the two of us left in the orchestra. And with the Coquettes, we uh, we were quite famous. We, we made some uh, movies, and uh, you know, people did, got, got to be quite well known. But that, that's when I wanted to get to New York. But when my last sister dropped out, when got married, I heaved a sigh of relief. Now I was going to be going to New York. That was always my dream, going to New York. And sure enough, when she died, when my sister, my sister, last sister got married, I went to New York and... Then my life began. I feel like the rest was all preliminary stuff. <laughs> Do you remember about how old you were at that time? At, getting get to New York, I was um, in the late 20s. Late 20s. And how did you support yourself when you went to New York? Were you able to support yourself? Well, in New York, home? you see, you're not supposed to work for two months. So uh, I, uh, some musicians needed a drummer to audition, but they were going to work, work. They could work in New York, and I couldn't. So I, uh, they needed a drummer for an audition. I said, I'll audition, but I can't take the job. So that's what we did. We auditioned. And uh, uh, the, the, the man club in 52nd Street, the, day, the days when 52nd Street was very popular, the, uh, the, band, the war had just started, and... The big bands had gotten down to small bands, Junior, Junior, Cooper's group and, and uh, uh, Benny Goodman's group. But the very small groups were on 52nd Street, New York. 
they had given up their bands because we lost, lost their musicians to the war. And that those years is when the girl orchestras became popular, and so the girl two girl musicians asked me to audition with them, even if I couldn't keep the job, which I did. And then the manager of the club said no. And he said he won't hire the girls without the girl drummer. So the, I had to go to the musicians. You did get permission to play, which I did. The minute I got to New York, I was playing drums professionally on 52nd Street, on the Swing Street where all the big bands were. And Billy Gladstone came to see the orchestra, our little group. And he said, come backstage at Radio City Music Hall. I'll show you a few tricks. And he was a famous drummer, Gladstone. And that, then I took lessons from him. And let me see, from there, <laughs> so much has happened. We well, finally- Can I ask you something about Billy Gladstone? Yeah. Um, so he taught you, were you using the full 13 piece drum set that you were using yet at that point? At, oh yes, I was, I was playing all those drums mm -hmm. before I met Gladstone. And were, did you use the Gladstone technique with the two big? No, that I no this or this I did early on, and I don't even. Oh yes, I I remember where I saw saw a drummer, in Texas, and he had a drum, a little bit raised, a little bit, not much. You know, normally the drummers were with the raised top tops, but he had a little higher. So I thought, no, I'll go a step higher. I'll do it up here. So that would get me the idea, and. Uh, and Billy Glad, by that time, I already had the big, all the drums and all. And he became, became my teacher, uh, uh, you know, later in life. I mean, when I say later in life, this was in the, uh, with Gladstone. <laughs> I probably in the late 20s, yeah. early 30s, thereabouts. Um, you also were known for your showmanship. Well, you see, when you have a drum up here and a drum out there, all you have to do is get up there and it looks like showmanship. So I had no problem with showmanship once I had the drums up there. If I was going to do this, nobody would see you talk about showmanship. So I had to hand it to me. Were you a shy person? No. Or not at all? Not ever? at all. Not at all. Ever? No. I was just wondering, because I've seen your videos, and I've seen you playing, yeah. and... The, uh, nothing shy about me. Yeah, no. I, I could like, go up to strangers and talk to them. Yeah. Um, I just want to make sure I'm not, like, skipping too much stuff, because I have a lot of questions from the, from the 40s, but then you were studying with Billy Gladstone. You said that was, like, late 20s. Um, is there anything that Learn, more into the thirties? Really, yeah, you know, because I was, you know, I was well into my career when I was still studying with him. I joined Phil Spitali Orchestra, which was the greatest drummer, drummer uh, greatest orchestra of, of the country. It remained so, and he died until Billy, until uh, uh, Phil Spitali died. It was the greatest girl orchestra in the country. And I, I joined them in 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 uh, fifty two. 1952, and I was there for 13 and a half years before he died, before Phil Spitalny died. But for 13 and a half years, I was with Phil Spitalny's Girl Orchestra, Hour of Charm Orchestra. We, we broadcasted for, for a seven-year program every Sunday for seven years of broadcasts. He was very famous, the most famous girl orchestra in the country. And the only one, I mean, oh no, I shouldn't say the only one. There were a lot of good, good girl orchestras, big, big girl orchestras. But were we had this, we had this radio broadcast for so many years, so we we became the best known of the orchestras. Were you aware of any other uh, female women drummers growing up, or uh, were sure. you the only one really? That well, you of? I was the only one who gained publicity through Phil Spitalny. So whatever, there were girl drummers around, but they didn't get any publicity because I had the made-in publicity thing with Phil Spitali. Outside of that, the girl drummers, there were some. 
and they never really got the publicity that they deserved. They were good girl drummers, too. Um, and just let, just let, if I'm missing anything that's really important, I don't want to jump too far ahead oh. if there's anything else you want to talk about, but I did have a question um, about uh, the article you wrote in 1941, the Give Girl Musicians a Break. Oh, yeah. Um, but and you, yeah, during the war, you know, yeah. girls kind of took early over the war, war, Early war days. Um, was it difficult being a women musician because of, like, job security? Were you always afraid that... Well, that you see, and... I had a made-to-order because I had a family orchestra to, to get the rolling. Other girl drummers didn't have any anything anything so so easy so easy to all my life it was so easy one thing led to another but all the, mainly because I had the background of the girl of the all the sisters to get me launched somehow I, I had no problem ever getting jobs yeah. and why did you write did you write that letter um, because, the, for for other women, the downbeat article. Yeah. Uh, how did that come about? Uh, I didn't know it was going in the magazine. I was telling talking to somebody, and I somehow or other was surprised when the magazine came out with all the things I had said, and I really wasn't very much aware of the fact that it was going in the magazine. I I don't know now why why I didn't didn't realize it. But I kept talking, talking to somebody, and finally I saw it in print. That would surprise me. Yeah. So. What kind of feedback did did you get feedback from anyone after the? Oh, the, was oh, the girl musicians were so happy about this because I mentioned so many girl names. All the girls I knew, good musicians, because we uh, we got to know the best girl musicians were around. Uh, you know, being in the business. Somehow or other, I, I, I knew girl musicians. I could mention all these names in the Downbeat magazine. So uh, everybody was very happy with me publicizing them. Yeah, it was gonna, free publicity. Yeah, it was good publicity for me, too. <laughs> um, and you, you were engaged to be... Married. I was married, yeah. He was, he went, uh, Chuck Mills went overseas before we got married. We planned to get married. And he was in New York, and we were making plans, and all of a sudden he was whisked away overnight. All the men over, all the soldiers over in New York waiting to be shipped across. They never knew when they were going. They were just, all of a sudden they disappeared from the sea, and they were in a ship good, good, leaving, leaving the country. So he went to war. The same day he went to war, my dad died in Chicago, in, in Wisconsin. He went away. No, not the day he went away. It's the day he crossed over when the war began, June, the 6th of June. The, well, the, war, the day the war began when the men were crossing from England to Germany, to France, that same day, that's the day my dad died. And he was there, but he didn't die. He, he made it, but, but the fact was, here was this this trauma. Oh yes, I was playing six shows a day in the, in the Paramount Theater in New York, and he was going across, he was crossing, and Dad died. Everything was happening at one time. So I was playing my drum solo, and I fainted, but I didn't fall off the chair. I fainted because of the turmoil in my life, and I had to play the drum solo. So. <laughs> I was sitting there, the dad and, and Phil Spitali kept waving to me. She'd say, Viola, Viola, play. And I was sitting there. So he mentioned the bass player had to come over and push me. And so she, she woke me up. She got me back in goof. And I jumped into my drum solo. And I played as if I'd never played before. I really played as if nothing happened. Just you forget yourself, you know, when you get into your soul, you have to do something. I forgot all about Dad, the guy going overseas, you know. So it was a rough day, but I made that it like five days, four, four shows that day, five shows. Yes, yeah, so, um, that seems like, well, by today's standards, especially, 
a lot of work. Um, and you said that you always had fun and you never considered drumming fun. No, never, never work. But six, show, six shows a day, well, like how many hours a day was that working? Was it like a full-time job? Well, uh, no, no. Well, full, not six shows often. Five shows, maybe weekends. But normally the week was four shows a day and five on weekends. So when there were six shows, was was very unusual occasion. Usually five shows on the weekend. But uh, I never thought of it as work. It was always fun. Yeah. You played with the Hour of Charm Orchestra until 1954? Until 55, yeah. Phil Spitali, Hour of Charm. I mean, that was a radio program, television pro. No, that was first stage, it was radio, still radio. Hour of Charm Orchestra. And I played with them uh, uh, for 13 years when he died. And I, I had a quick question about the kind of music industry at the time because things have changed so much. But at the time, when you joined an orchestra, or when, when you played different shows, were were you kind? Of, did you were you like a contract player, like, like Hollywood film stars or something? Or how how did you get paid? Um, is that does that make any sense? <laughs> you, um, or was it just like one job at a time? Or uh, no, one job, one thing lead, always leads to another. Got to Phil Spitality Orchestra, and a month later we were in Hollywood making a picture, because he had already contracted for, for a picture with Abbott Costello, in Hollywood. We made two Hollywood pictures, one with Abbott Costello, A B B O T T, and Costello, and then the other one with uh, with uh, Jones. Uh, Did you enjoy making Hollywood films? Making films. Yeah. Was oh it wow! What a ball! <laughs> We'd meet so many stars. You know, we'd be in the rehearsal room, for instance, and we'd go outside and sit in the sunlight, maybe for whatever, where there was a break. When you'd go outside, there were a lot, a lot of stars around, sitting around, also making, making their shows, I mean, doing their thing in another theater or another rehearsal hall. So we'd meet so many stars, right and left, about where you went. It was fun. Really fun. Any memorable ones or anyone you were really excited about? There's so much excitement there for <laughs> four months of Hollywood pictures. The two months each picture. Yeah. I don't know where to start with pictures. Yeah. I had a scrapbook of pictures of uh, stars. You had a story about, um, and this is probably going back kind of far, but about going to see Billie Holiday, too? Oh, Billie Holiday. So we went to where she was playing, and she, the place was so jammed. It was on 52nd Street. It was during the war, and the war had just started. The men were all crowding the little little 52nd Street uh, houses, and all each one had a name band, reduced to maybe two or three musicians. And in this one place, one night we went to see how Billie Holiday, and it was so tight, it was so close and so tight, they had to bring a little table for two people. And they had set it right in front of Philly Holiday, right at the, at the, there was this much space made. They squeezed it in. And so I sat right up where she was right here. And I was leaning against her dress as I was playing. That's how tight it was. They had to make room for everybody, you know, and they kept pushing people in. And then her dress was hanging over me, and I, I was annoyed because she was my hair. My had such a I was well coiffed, and then she was oh my hair was full of her hair, her dress. I couldn't move, and she, she was in my dress. <laughs> my, my, my hair <laughs> was so funny when I think of it now. Anyway, she died not very much later than that. A few years later, she died, but it was nice, wonderful hearing her. <laughs> Yeah. Great, great, lovely. And that's a pretty funny story to have. She forever. what? What? It's a pretty funny story to be oh. able to tell everybody. <laughs> Billy Holiday's dress. Oh, and my hair. And my hair. Boy, I hated my hair. My hair was so well coiffed. <laughs> <laughs> um, were all of the clubs like 
during that time period? Were they packed all the time? All packed was and it? all big bands, big big names with their little groups because they all had to close their big bands. They lost their musicians, so they wound up with their with them with just two musicians usually three. Billy Betty Goodman, three three musicians, all the way down the street about four day bands, just nothing but day bands on the street. Um, okay, now I'm going to go back up. After Hour of Charm disbanded, you led your own band, Viola and her 17 drums. I had that all through Phil Spitaldi Orchestra. When, when I played with Phil Spitaldi, I was always billed as Viola and her 17 drums because I always did a solo with him, and I got billing. After Evelyn, there was Phil Spitaldi and Evelyn and Viola. Viola Smith, they called me just Viola. Um, can you talk about the what what you did in like the sixties and then going into the seventies? Did you play professionally until nineteen seventy five? I played professionally practically all my life because everything we did was professional work. When we played the weekends and uh, when we were growing up, we were already playing the big places on weekends. We were practically professional all through our lives. It was amazing that we got such a wonderful start with, with where we played. And so we was, were doing professional work, actually. We weren't professionals. I mean, we were just growing up professionally. <laughs> yeah. But we did the work where the professionals were working right through our lives. Yeah. Um, we followed the big bands, no matter where, the, where you know, wherever we went. We we followed the big bands, even when we were going up with the orchestra. We had good work. In the in the nineteen sixties and seventies, did or was there ever a time in your life where you got less work or less jobs because the no. music was changing, or it's no. always steady? Always, but except that when I joined Phil Spitaldi, fortunately, there are many t many months that we had free, like the summer months for Phil Spitaldi Orchestra. He wanted a vacation for two months, so he gave us a vacation for two months, which was wonderful for me, because two times I went to Europe for the two months, for, for two full two months, because I had to take advantage of being out of New York, you know, yeah. had to take advantage of that. So I had wonderful vacations. Two months, two different times, two months. And I've gone as far as Morocco. Oh, wow. I traveled. I was traveling. I couldn't get anybody to come along with me to go, go where I wanted to go. I mean, to spend the money. I had the money to spend because I had somebody who helped me, <laughs> somebody who, the, the man in my life, he... He said, go here, go there, go. You have to see the world. And, and I, I couldn't get a girl, any girl to go and, and spend the money that he spent on me for me to go. And so I went alone. It didn't bother me. Alone? I traveled alone. And, and my, the man I was going with said, you've got to stay at the best hotels. When you travel alone, you can't be anywhere but the best hotels to be safe. And it was turned true that I could see from what I heard, too, that that this was, was the safest way to travel. I found out later that it was true. Uh, I was so safe, it wouldn't have mattered if I had, had a guide with me. It was absolutely safe. I've always traveled alone, because I never got anybody to spend the money that I was spending. And I couldn't have spent it either without this, this man I planned to marry, which turned out that he you know, had a problem with the marriage with and problem getting away from his wife. <laughs> Wait, was it the same man that went to war? Uh, oh no, that that man came person? back, came back after three years. Oh no, that dwindled all. That I was engaged to get married, but in three years, uh, by that time I had met my my the person, the the man I lived uh, not lived. I didn't live with him. The man of my life. When the, when the one came back. Um, he wasn't too surprised. He didn't leave. He didn't stay in town very long after he came back. He went right to Florida with the group. He uh, he was a he was a an orchestra leader. 
and he immediately picked up a group, and they played the best hotel in, in Florida as a as a relief band. You know, they had the big bands in Florida in the hotels, and he was a conductor, Charles Bills, and the conductor of a small group for intermissions or, uh, yeah, the uh, alternate orchestra, the big clubs. Yeah. So he immediately left town after he knew what the score was. That you know, I said it's all over. And he he already knew by my letters. You know that, that it was kaput, kaput. Yeah, <laughs> moved on. <laughs> <laughs> so we had no problem with that. He's, Do you think he, if if you had ever gotten married that you would have quit music or not oh, been able to play? I never much? even considered the thing. I never even I never even thought about it. Um, this is the first time I even thought that you would, uh, would I have given up drums if I had gotten married. Never thought of it until right now. <laughs> I don't I thought know. about it because I was reading about your um, the family band and how your sisters would quit once they got married. Yeah, they so all it quit. seems like at the time you could only kind of do one or the other. Yeah, you either be married or play in the orchestra. <laughs> so, um, well, I'm glad that. I'm glad that you didn't have to make that decision. Oh, yeah. You got to play uh, drums for Everything was, the decisions were always made for me for somehow or other. I just, I don't know. I never really had a problem with anything that I did. Um, I want to ask you a couple of funny questions. I, I read, this comes up a lot in on the internet when you, when I look up your name. That you turned down Frank Sinatra. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, sure. Well, you Who see, does that? you know what happened? He was a big, a big man in, at the Astor Hotel in Chicago, in New York. And we were at work next door at a theater next door in New York. And the night at night in New York, the musicians would go to pick a rib, pick a rib place that gather there uh, because of. People somehow or other, people love ribs, the musicians, all the musicians I do, they all love ribs. So these different bands would congregate there, and the, luckily the tables in that club at the pick a rib place were all tables for eight people. So every night we were there, after we played the theater for three months, and so did Sinatra play at his Astor Hotel for three months. Both of us did the same thing. But I already had met him at the, over at the Astro Hotel, but now we met it up there. And he was at the same table with me. So two, two different times he asked me for a date. But he was so ugly. He was so ugly before his operation. You can, I can't, you can't tell you how. I couldn't, the thought of dating, yeah, that, I don't know. I just didn't even consider it. But then he had the operation. But after the operation, he never asked me for a date again. After that, it was Lana Turner and, and Ava Gardner and, oh, my God, who knows? All of them. He went, played the gamut of, of girl, of ladies, of the, I mean, the lovely ladies of the day. Just one from one to the other. And, but never me. I, I was out of it then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's even funnier than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> so, um. And you also, I read that you performed with Ella Fitzgerald and Chick Webb. Well, uh, at, at, the, at the Paramount Theater in New York, they had a star night. They had, the, uh, had not the Andrews sisters, Boswell sisters in those days. Boswell sisters, that's how far back it was. In my earlier years in, in New York, they had uh, Chick Webb, Andrew, no, not about the Boswell sisters, but Andrews. I mean, I mean Mag Maxine Andrews. I knew Maxine at the time. The, Mag the Andrews sisters were already popular because I knew Maxine at the time. And I, I double dated with her. Uh, that, but that was another period, another time. But going to this one night stand at the Paramount Theater, all this, these stars come. And I was there, and I, they had me play drums with Bob Crosby Orchestra. Play and play, sit in, to sit in and play a drum, drum, drum solo. And uh, it was just a one night stand. But uh, but the Boswells was the Boswell girl was in a wheelchair. Remember one of the Boswells? You will remember those days with Boswells. That's way back. I know the Andrews. That's sisters, before yeah, Andrews. But Maxine, I already knew Maxine Andrews, because then later on we played with Maxine Andrews with the Andrews sisters for eight months. 
It was a show. It was a show. We traveled with them. And she and I, Maxie and I, double dated at the Paramount Theater, at the, at the Oriental Theater in Chicago. We would date the ushers. <laughs> we'd go horse, we'd go bicycle riding between shows. The bicycle path was just a few blocks away from the Oriental Theater. And there was time between shows to go bicycle riding. That's because we're so close. And the bicycle place was to get bicycle was right there, the place to rent a bicycle. See, I don't I don't know much about your your life or your drumming career from 1975 and then how you kind of wound up at at Peacemakers here and you've you've lived here for quite a while. If you could just talk a bit about um like the 70s, the 80s, kind of what you did when the drumming slowed down or when music slowed down. Well, I know you performed in, in cabaret, right, for a long time. Oh, Was yes, like your last three years in cabaret, mm -hmm. three years. We were a foursome, the group, a, yeah. in a show, a show within the show, so we are a group. And then we practiced, then after cabaret closed after three years, we still went on the road and, and played quite a bit, of, you know, as, a, as an act. Strange thing that two of those girls out of four died rather early, not many years after that. And they were young girls, they were younger, much younger than I. Two of them died. Mm. Uh, it's just hard to believe out of four, you know. Uh, now let me see, where am I in my life? <laughs> I've been jumping see. around so much. No, I, I know, well, like you said, there's a lot. And it's, oh, now, it's okay. now later in life. Well, I, I didn't work for 50 years. 60 years, I think, now. For the last five years, I've been at this place where I am, just by chance, that I, with my cousin, I went to visit the woman in charge here, uh, who had ran the place. We went to visit her, she was an aunt of mine. And she said, you're gonna, the very first day, the very first, within an hour I met her, she said, you're gonna stay here the rest of your life. That's what you're gonna do. You're gonna stay here the rest of your life and we were sitting together. And she said, I said, what? <laughs> the rest of my life? <laughs> and, and, and that was, I was here, that was six years ago. That She's died since. But it's been wonderful here. Oh, the meals. Couldn't be better. Yeah. Terrific meals. Oh, I do have one question about you being a drummer that I forgot to ask earlier. How were you treated by um, male musicians that you worked with? Because it seemed like you were very well respected and that you had a lot of peers, even though you were a, a female drummer, which was a little Well, see, there's nothing unusual for musicians, male bands, to always have girl singers. And uh, I don't think I felt any different from those girl singers who were always among all these men. They sort of treated me like another per, like like one of the men. They they there was no no. Uh, it was so simple. It was easy. I don't know. I've been asked that before, and it's, it was nothing. It was just like the girl singers, as if I had been a girl singer. The same. I was a girl drummer. Yeah. So I was just accepted. That's good. Yeah, it's good. It was easy. It was yeah. easy. No problem. I've had no problems in my life to speak of. Not even in health. I've been unf I'm very fortunate in my health. I have no problems. I also really like this, this quote from an interview that I read with you. You said, one thing always led to another. Everything went very easily in my life. I really had a charmed life. Unless people called drumming work, then I worked hard in my life. <laughs> oh, exactly. That's exactly what I felt. It was all fun. And, but drumming is fun. Mm. Um, who were some of your major musical influences, and do you still listen to music now? I've been it got more into serious music. I'm more of, of, an, of an opera buff and a, and a symphony orchestra. When I go to a concerts, I go to symphonies and to the opera. Uh, oh, yeah, I've gotten over the dance band feeling. I've, I feel closer to the symphony now. Um, what are you most proud of personally and or professionally? What I'm most proud of. Yeah. Never life. thought of it. I, nobody ever asked me that in my life. 
This is it. I guess it's because I have nothing to be proud of. <laughs> They've never thought that there's anything to be proud of. Proud of. I'm, I'm proud of my health. I mean, what I, I don't think I contributed much to it, but uh, somehow or other I feel like I helped get this old. Uh, I'm not, I can't pin, pinpoint it. I've always been sure to get my eight hours sleep, you know, certain things. And I, all my life I ate very well, as good as I could eat. And from age 50 on, from, I joined, from the day I joined Phil's Battalion, that was in 50, 52, I have never had to worry about a dollar in my life. From age 52, I didn't worry how much money I spent. That's all these years. I've never had to worry about what money I spent. I spent it as I wanted to. And it all came, always came easily. And uh, I never, I guess, needed much or something. I don't know why. I just lived the life of Riley. Just as age, since age, age 52, that I never, never counted a dollar. Never mattered how much money I spent. Mm. So it's been easy. <laughs> that made it easy. Are you proud of your of what you've accomplished musically and your drumming? Well, it wasn't so great what I did in drumming, but it was was it all a luck. So much so it was luck. It was luck that I started playing those drums up here that helped my my life my my career a lot. I had drums up here that I was doing something that every nobody else was doing. And that's what helped me a lot, I'm sure. And just a few more. Um, I don't know if you, you might not ever think about this, but how do you feel about your role in or your contribution to kind of popular music history as a whole? Do you think that, do you think that you play an important part in that? Do you care if you're remembered or, or not for your? Well, I was I was in the early years. There weren't many girl drummers, you see, so I was a little bit of. I had the extra drums, and I had good jobs. I had I had I was. I was seen more than others. I was two movies. I had better, I had great luck in my life. Everything always came so easy. And it isn't for girl musicians necessarily. Is it, is it at all important to you that your, um, that your history as a musician be remembered in, in music history? People always ask me whether I should leave my that I should leave my drums to the Smithsonian Institution, and that sort of takes my breath away because I when I heard it for the first time it it, it was just I can't imagine that that I should have something to contribute to the Smithsonian and I've heard it so many times that I've gotten used to it but it's just hard to believe that little old me should be in the Smithsonian Institution so I can't believe it yet. And still haven't put it in my will. Yeah. By the way, I still have my will. I still haven't made it. You still haven't made it. <laughs> no, but I've made a lot of wills. But I was torn them up. Yeah. I'm, I'm right now. I'm really without a will because once I'm gonna, I change it. I keep changing my will. So I've had a lot of wills. <laughs> well, you see, Mom Kate, you just celebrated your hundred and fifth birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank um, you. Yeah, and I mean. <laughs> You might be around for a while longer, so... I'll tear up my will. <laughs> <laughs> or do you still play drums at all? I, I read that oh, you... Well, uh, see, here where I am for six years, in this place where I visited my my aunt, and this girl drummer there, they have a group, group a wonderful little group, and the girl drummer is this. So she was called to play a drum roll one time for an announcement. She was a good drummer, but she couldn't play a drum roll. Which was surprising. I surprised. I thought, how could be a drummer without playing the drum roll? But if you don't study it, if you don't, you have to work on it. You have to. You don't just automatically pick up sticks and play a drum roll. So she was just, oh, you know, and she didn't do anything. She didn't do anything about it. So the next day, that's when I picked up my drumsticks. So we have started 
I got her to play the drum roll. So we started, I started teaching. That's when I picked up with the drum roll after about 60, 60 years, I guess. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, 55 years. Did you pick up right where you left off? Still come naturally? Yes, yeah, come naturally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I'll just end with this one. And, well, I'll, have, I'll ask you, too, if there's anything that I left. But do you think that things have um, changed for female musicians? Like, do you notice that there are more opportunities now? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, yes. No comparison. There were never opportunities for girl musicians. The men would just... would. would not hear of it, you know. Even conductors, you know, wouldn't hear of it. Girl drummers were, um, oh, yeah. What do they know? That's it. What do they? Know? What do girl drummers know? It wasn't easy. It's because I fell into it with the family orchestra, and then with the naturally the Phil Spitalde orchestra. He really made it the hard way with a lot of work and with this girl, big girl orchestra. That paved the way for all these musicians because he, he became so famous that that it made it easy for girl musicians after that, that he made, he paved the way. And see, I'm sure there's so many things that I left out. Um, is there anything that, that I didn't bring up or that we didn't talk about that you, that you would like to talk about or that I didn't ask? <laughs> we talked about so much, I don't know what, what there's left. I know. It's, it was 105 years of interview guide. 105 years. Yeah. It's hard to believe. I know. Well... I really appreciate you sitting down with us today. Well, it's it's an honor to have somebody want want to interview me. No, I, I told we've been talking about this. I flew in a week ago, and we are all like, "Can't wait for Viola Smith's interview." I can't believe it. So, we're all big fans, and I really, really appreciate. Well, are you musicians? It. I take mm -hmm. it you yeah. are. Oh yeah. Yeah. Are you drummers? I play drums. Yeah. All drummers? No. No, wait, do you? Play drums? I don't no. know. You play drums. Yeah. Oh really? Yeah, yeah. Oh really? Drummers. Two girl drummers. Two drummers. Yeah. I never even asked about that. I never even thought about it until right now. Yeah. Well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So talking to another drummer. Yeah. Um but I think I think that's it. If you feel okay. I feel like there's nothing left to say or left for me to think about. <laughs> All right. Thank that's you it. very much.